Hello everyone and welcome back to the analyst dated 19th of April where we will learn good details about the current affair articles which are as follows. In the first one, we will understand all that you need to know about volcanoes as recently Mount Ruang of Indonesia has erupted. Then in the second one, we will build our awareness regarding our right to vote as the first phase of Lok Sabha elections commences from today. Then we will analyze what is causing this drop in the private investments in India and why do we need to care about it. Then we will look into the details of yet another contested religious complex between Hindus and Muslims. This is the Bhot Shala Kamal Mola complex dispute of Madhya Pradesh. And then we will look into the Israel's defense system, which is protecting it against several aerial attacks. And then we will finally wind up the discussion with a quick revision of very informative and interesting prelim snippets for your upcoming prelims examinations. So stay tuned. So in our first topic, we will read about a deadly hazard, which also gets converted into disaster. Here we are going to talk about volcanoes and in particular, the eruption of volcano Ruang in Indonesia. In the previous analyst, few months back, we've also covered the volcano Merapi of Indonesia, which is one of the deadliest volcanoes. And why is this so that Indonesia sees a lot of volcanoes? We'll understand all of this. This pertains to GS1 part of the syllabus inside geography, where you have to read about geophysical phenomena and also GSC, where we have to read about disaster management. So first of all, what are volcanoes? To understand volcanoes, please understand a process known as volcanism, which leads to the formation of volcanoes. Volcanoes are basically some geomorphic structures, which are resulting from a process known as volcanism. Volcanism is nothing but the eruption of solid, liquid and gaseous material from the magma or called the magma and this magma could comprise of all the solid liquid and gaseous material and this magma when it tries to escape out from the mantle specifically from a more weakened area of mantle that is the asthenosphere and when it tries to escape onto the surface of the earth then it is known as the process of volcanism because of this process there are certain landforming structures which takes place inside the beneath the crust beneath the crust and also on the surface of the crust and therefore it leads to creation of lot of landforms one of them are the volcanoes so depending upon the type of vent from where this magma is coming out and by the way the magma which has came on the surface of the earth is known as lava so it is no more a magma so the kind of the kind of fissure or the kind of space from which it moves out eventually creates or determines the type of the landform it will be creating. So let's say for example, you have typically imagined volcano as that of a mountain. Mountain because this has got a pipe, a central pipe like fissure from which this magma is coming out and then leading to creation of lava. This lava solidifies and creates this conical structure which is known as volcano. But there is other form as well in which this magma tries to come through fissures or through large crevasses on the surface of the earth leading to them spreading in the form of sheets and this leads to creation of extensive landforms for example plateaus can you name one a Deccan plateau is one of that so this is about volcanoes and related landforms how does it takes place well the source the source chamber is your magmatic chamber so magma it melts and float because it is subjected to heavy temperature and pressure then because there is a lot of gases inside it it's like a hot boiling pot where there is a lot of gas so gas naturally tries to push up this entire magma upwards once it tries to push up wherever it finds the weaker zones weaker zones for for example somewhere where plate tectonic is happening the plate boundaries are there specifically in the OC collisions OC means somewhere between ocean and where oceanic plates and the continental plates are colliding specifically in these regions the magma tries to come outside and because of the pressure that it 
that it gets from the chamber lid that causes it to erupt rather intensively have a very intensive push and spread out extensively this leads to this leads to creation of volcanoes on the earth if you talk about the regions which are more prone to volcanic activity we have got the ring of fire that is a circum pacific region why because this is where the prominent collision or tectonic activity is taking place here is where the pacific plate the oceanic plate is colliding with a land plate or a continental plate like south american plate and north american plate i've already told you that volcanoes mostly takes place wherever there is ocean and continental plate colliding that is why in the himalayan belt you are seeing plate tectonics happening but because this is a cc or continent to continent collision therefore you will see earthquakes but not volcanoes so please understand it should be an oc collision oc collision is prominently seen in the ring of fire and since indonesia lies in the ring of fire new zealand lies in ring of fire north america south america these parts hawaii lies in uh, this ring of fire therefore it is one of the reasons that these are the global hot spots 80% of the total volcanoes happens in the ocean uh, this specific ring of fire but it's not the only place even in the mediterranean sea you will see a lot of volcanoes for example etna stromboli vesuvius etc why because this crumbling of the plates of the mediterranean sea so again not the collision is happening plate tectonic though is not happening but still the crumbling of the plates and the micro plate colliding with each other causes volcanoes to happen so this is the region of active volcanoes so this makes a sense why indonesia sees a lot of volcanoes because it lies in the ring of fire now we will talk about broadly how many types of volcanoes do we have so it depends on multiple classification factor one is how frequently is this volcano erupting on the basis of this this is classified as active which means it is erupting every now and then we are seeing it and therefore we have classified it as active volcanoes for example we have got mount vesuvius we have got Ma mount ruang we have mount merapi there are multiple specifically in the circum pacific area all of them are active volcanoes then we have got the dormant volcanoes so they have not erupted in the recent past but we know that in some geological past they have erupted and there is chance that they might erupt in the future they are categorized as a dormant vol volcano for example mount kilimanjaro of africa for example narkondam island which is near andaman and nicobar island of in of india then we have got mount hood of a uh, us so they are the dormant volcanoes now what if a volcano has taken up the structure and composition of lava or of the pyroclastic material but has not erupted even in you know going back to 10000 years it has not erupted basically not in our geographical uh, frame of scale so these are known as the extinct volcanoes generally seen in scotland so there is ben nevis of scotland then there is tamu massive one of the largest volcanoes underwater and this is in the pacific ocean in the sea floor of pacific ocean these are the extinct volcanoes these examples are going to help you a lot in framing answers for means then the second mode is on the mode of eruption from where is it coming out is it coming from a central vent leading to creation of conical structures or mountains that would be central vent and the second is fissure type whether it is getting uh, erupted from a crevasse for example deccan plateau then on the basis of lava characteristic now this determines whether it will be more in breadth or more in height so basically the composition is one of the most important things the nature of the magma uh, depends on content of silica silica is highly acidic in nature silica is highly acidic in nature which will make any content having silica very very viscous very very viscous or which means very very dense it, it's not very easy to flow now why is silica acidic because it is present towards the p block that is towards the right hand side of a periodic table which means it has got more acidic properties now naturally anything which has got more silica content will be more acidic will be more viscous which means once this kind of magma comes out it will start because it is very very thick it's not very easy to flow therefore it will start concentrating around the vent so much so that it will found or it will form one of the highest volcanoes one of the tallest volcanoes ever so they will be known as strato volcanoes or they will be known as composite volcanoes and this is happening because they are driven by acidic lava acidic lava that which is having more silica content for example ojas del salado which is the tallest tallest volcanic mountain or the tallest volcano which is in chile is actually a composite or an acidic mountain 
or an acidic lava lead volcano so the tallest one is ojas del salado it is in south america then comes to basic lava basic lava is where the silica content is less naturally viscosity is less it is very very flowy so it's not very good in height but it is very extensive which means the lava will flow to great extents therefore it will give rise to one of the largest not the tallest but the largest volcanoes can you give me an example the example is it to first of all this is known as shield volcano shield kind of volcanoes having low height but very very expansive uh, surface and an example of this is the mauna loa of hawaii which is the largest volcanoes ever these are not the tallest tallest is ojas del salado what makes a difference the composition of the lava so i hope the distinguishment is clear to you now we will talk about impacts volcanoes are hazards but they are natural hazards they have got negative impacts and positive impacts first of all talking about the negative impact some of the times a magma when it comes out could reach temperature more than 1000 degrees centigrade which means whatever comes its way it starts degrading it degenerating it destroying it completely so much so that back in 79th ad the mount vesuvius led to the burying of the entire roman cities pompeii and herculaneum so it can also drown the entire cities this can be done with the help of a specific type of lava which is the pyroclastic lava where the temperature is more than 1000 degree centigrade the second one is ash fall so you know that volcanoes also eject out some gases and some sulfuric substances and these are ashes so these ashes contaminate themselves in the atmosphere and whenever precipitation happens rainfall happens they fall back in the ground now such extensive falling back of this ash in the ground leads to loss of proper vision in the atmosphere and it also degrades the aesthetic beauty of that place this is known as ash fall now in iceland in this particular place i'm not the best person to pronounce this so in 2010 an eruption happened where the air space closures happened leading to huge losses in the aviation economy where in europe why because of the ash fall ash fall means that all of this ash contaminated in the atmosphere got precipitated back leading to erosion of the vision specifically for the aviation industry next is the climatic effects it has does it have a global warming effect or a global cooling effect so that depends again on the composition in the composition we have got sulfur dioxide so sulfur dioxide has got huge albedo so whenever sulfur dioxide gases is emitted in huge concentration in the atmosphere it builds up the albedo which means now the sunlight cannot penetrate inside the earth it will be reflected back leading to global cooling this has happened a lot of times in fact in 1815 it led to in indonesia what we call as an year without a summer this was done by eruption made by mount tambora then in 1991 in philippines we saw mount pinatubo to again cause a global climatic cooling event specifically in that localized area of southeast asia the other thing it does is mud flows now mud flows is where the solid lava along with the other fragments of soil and rock gets carried away under the pressure and influence of water and it flows down the valley degrading the crops degrading the infrastructure etc this is mud flow and it was seen in nevado del ruiz in colombia in 1985 which affected a city called ermiro and it got completely degraded for up to and it took multiple years to rejuvenate it so it leads to huge economic losses next is tectonic instability now when a magma of such a high temperature pressure is getting erupted out might be possible that it might change or alter the stress conditions or the stress and the strain conditions on the earth crust as a result it might induce certain kind of plate tectonics even if it is micro amount therefore it leads to plate tectonic instability which can in fact lead to other things for example the mud flow for example landslides etc so these are the negative impacts but certain positive impacts are also there all accruing to its composition again the composition also contains of something called potassium we have got calcium we have got phosphorus which are in fact one of the macronutrients required by the soil so therefore it enables fertility in the soil leading to better agriculture and better forestry in such areas as you can see in the hawaii as you can see in indonesia good in agriculture good in forestry why because they are very very rich in 
soil. Next is the geothermal energy that is coming again a form of green energy and this is coming this is beneficial specifically for the polar regions which are lying in the circum pacific belt which means they can derive their energy specifically from geysers and hot springs and some geothermal power plants can also be set so they can ensure uh, over the clock supply of electricity with the help of these geothermal energy plants which are fed by geothermal energy of the volcanoes okay specifically useful in iceland and new zealand of course they form extremely scenic beautiful landscape we have got mount etna mount stromboli we have got mount vesuvius so all of them also attract tourists so it also aids the economy of that place for example the yellowstone national park having very very high geothermal potential so that in usa mount vesuvius in italy some of the examples where they also attract tourists when we are talking about their benefits should we also talk about the landforms there are two broad kinds of landform whether the geological formation is happening over the surface of the earth leading to formation of vast extensive plateaus or leading to formation of cinder cones or parasitic cones or leading to formation of something that we know as dikes and sills so dikes and sills are not exactly on the surface of the earth but very very close to surface of the earth so when the spread of magma has happened in a horizontal direction then this is known as sills and when it has penetrated on the earth in a vertical direction then they are known as dikes the other intrusive landforms landforms which are found beneath the surface of the earth beneath the surface of the earth are known as intrusive landforms let me quickly tell you all about it so just imagine that we have a we have a small crescent shape crescent shape landform where a small amount of lava has solidified this is known as a facolith now what if this enlarges in its length what if this enlarges in its length and also gets converted into a concave soccer like shape then this will be known as lopolith what if this facolith gets enlarged in height then in that case it is known as lacolith and what if it gets enlarged both in length in height and in breadth then this is known as batholith batholiths are the most extensive intrusive landforms as you can see so this was all about discussion on volcanoes now a great day for us we can exercise a right to vote from today because uh, the first phase of the lok sabha elections have commenced for about 39 lok sabha seats where about 14 crore people will be turning out and the final evaluation will be taking up on 4th of june so for this we have to understand what is our right to vote and how do we have it so we have got the right to vote as one of the constitutional rights that are given by us via article 326 of the indian constitution which provides for indiscriminate universal adult suffrage to any citizen of india that is above the age of 18 years of age so it is a constitutional right now a question was asked on this on upsc and this was a very controversial question whether the right to vote which is granted to us is a constitutional right or a legal right well to clarify that it's both of them it's legal right as well it is constitutional right as well but it is considered by upsc as a constitutional right which is provided to us duly by an article which is article 326 so it's not just provided by the rpa the representations of people act yes that also provides so therefore this is also a legal right but whenever you have to make a comparison between legal right and constitutional right and you find the same article in both the places you have to give it a better stature of constitutional right so here the answer which upsc considered correct was constitutional right so you and me have got the constitutional right to vote now it also is given by the representations of people act in 1950 which asks for the preparation of electoral rolls for different levels of election at the parliamentary level assembly levels and council constituency level then in 1951 they also called for giving free supply of certain materials to the electoral rolls and also made certain practices against corrupt practices in electoral offences in order to ensure free and fair election in india now as you know that what do you mean by democracy democracy is something which is by the people for the people and of the people so the only way to assert our power over the democracy the best way to do is to perform voting so therefore everyone who is eligible and who is interested and who has got elections in their constituencies must go to vote so we will also talk about the evolution 
the evolution of the voting rights because we had a long history of struggle it all started with the government of india act 1909 this is also the act which is known as morley minto reforms why morley because he was the secretary of the state and minto was the viceroy at that time he is also known as the father of communal electorate because for the first time the act provided for communal electorate but that's not the thing of discussion right now this for the first time granted limited franchisee based on the following things not based on gender or anything but based on the utility for british administration that is whether you have education whether you are tax paying citizen or whether you have got certain property so only powerful and influential people were made to vote not everybody was done this franchisee this electorate the separate electorate was also further expanded in the government of india act 1919 because it was promised by the british while they were taking our help in the first world war then in 1935 it called for overall enhancement of the franchisee but it still was valid for only 10% of the citizens 10% of the total population finally when we achieved the independence the constitution gave us this right with the help of providing universal adult suffrage which said that it allowed every adult citizen to vote irrespective of gender caste religion and literacy now you and me the citizens of india have got the right to vote but has everybody got right to vote we have got people in different domains for example we have got citizens who are not working in india and for economic purposes they are not considered as residents of india these are the nris who are working abroad can they vote the answer evolves through this discussion first of all yes they can vote and they were allowed for the first time using through an amendment done in the representations of people act 1950 and it was introduced for the first time in the year 2011 an nri can actually vote in the india but by moving to the same constituency by moving to the same constituency which is considered as his place of residence in his passport because obviously he doesn't have voter id card he doesn't have any uh, your aadhar card so he has to carry passport documentation if he want to perform his electoral or voting right but in 2017 of course election commission said that this is very retrogradive and what we want to do we want to enable them because this is huge resource pool and we are losing out on their votes so rather we should bring them or we should allow a proxy to vote in their place so this bill was there in the parliament but it got rejected so finally in 2018 election commission of india proposed a new change and this was incorporated via rpa amendment this was to vote via postal ballots postal ballots is the similar method through which are armed personals who are posted somewhere else other than india or maybe in some other uh, areas which are not very accessible so they are made to vote by an electronic machine this is known as the electronically transferable postal ballot system so now nris can also do it without having to travel back to india this is via etbps or electronically transferable post ballot system will prisoners be able to vote in india according to the rpa act prisoners are not entitled for the legal right to vote but in certain cases they are if they are sentenced to a punishment for less than 2 years then in that case the person will be entitled to vote so prisoners having punishment having sentences less than 2 years so 2 years is the cut off please remember if they are sentenced to more than 2 years they will not be eligible to vote if they are under trial prisoners then also they will not be eligible to vote if they are being preventive detained or they are preventive detainees then in that case do they have the right to vote yes they have got the right to vote so this is pertaining to different sections of our population and do they have the right to vote and which constitution articles provides us the right to vote you should also know that the constitution of india empowers a particular body which is election commission of india under article 324 of the constitution to perform the superintendence direction and controlling the elections at the lok sabha level presidential level etc all but at the municipality levels or at the panchayati levels because that is done by state election commission all right so this was the basic things that we needed to know about the election that is getting conducted in the next topic we will look into the dropping private investments in india so recently it has been flagged that private investment has witnessed a steady decline since 2011 and 21 it was obvious during the covid times but even post covid times we've not seen enough recovery in the amount of private investments that are being made in the indian economy
So first of all, how do you gauge whether the private investments are good or not? This is with the help of a metric which is known as the gross fixed capital formation with respect to the percentage of GDP which means as compared to the growth of your GDP, how much is the involvement or how much is the investment of your private and your government sector into the development of fixed capital. So here we are calling for developing fixed capital. Fixed capital includes developing infrastructure, buildings, roads and machineries, something that is not going to give us dividends in the shorter runs, not immediately, but definitely in the longer runs. So this is how we gauge whether we are getting the private, whether we are getting the investments or not. Now, these investments or this gross fixed capital formation happens from two wings. One is the private sector and second is the government sector. Though it has been seen that the government expenditure is increasing or the government investment increasing, but the private uh, investments are steeply declining. What is the importance, by the way, of having these private investments or having a strong gross fixed capital ratio? The importance is that once you put up money or investment into the economy, it will facilitate the industries, it will give rise and shoot to the production, the output, the yield and the productivity, the profit margins of the industries will increase, they will hire more people, it will lessen up the problems of unemployment, basically boosting the employment which boosts the standard of living of the people, which improves the overall economic output. So in order to create asset, we need money and that money comes from investments. You can see from this graph that there is sharp decline, specifically in the COVID years, it's understandable that why it was declining. But even during the recovery time, we are seeing rather inequity or inequitable growth of this uh, private investment. Now, talking about the historical trends of private investment in India, when we got the independence, we saw that the government took the responsibility of developing a socialist economy. So the government said that we will be, though we were a mixed economy, still most of the developmental initiatives, especially, you know, building the educational institutions like IITs, IIMs, building major industries, the PSUs, the PACs, etc., was taken up as a responsibility by the government. So therefore, during that time, private investment was mostly around just 10%. That was only given to some of the hands, like there was Ambani, there were Tatas, only a few of them. And public investment largely surpassed the private investment in 1980s. Of course, it led to fall down of the overall growth prospect of our economy. Our economy growth rate was very, very low because government alone cannot bear the entire burden. So then, the Indian economy opened up its gate for the liberalization, privatization and globalization reforms, So, which happened in 1991. So after that reforms, there was a shoot up in the private investment, which surged peaking up to 27% of the GDP. In fact, by 2001, it was reported that this reached more than 30%. In fact, it was somewhere about 30 to 34%. Then the COVID happened and again, it slumped down. The investments went down. Why? Because investments are driven by demands. If consumer is not consuming, then I will not be producing because the demand slumped, the investment also slumped. So what is what is surprising though is that the post global financial recovery is also pretty low. So even today in India, we see that it has declined to a low of less than 20% of the GDP, which is as you can see a fall down of up to 9 to 10% of what we used to have a decade ago. And this is continuously declining ever since the last 10 years. This is the trend observed in the private investment. What are the factors contributing? Again, there's a basic formula. Demand is the main driver and the main cause of investments. That too coming from the private sector because private sector is basically profit oriented. If they don't feel that this product is going to give us benefits, spe specifically if it's asking for a long term investment and they don't feel that it's going to be in demand, they will not be they will not be producing it. They will not be investing into it. So there is reduced business confidence. There is reduced business confidence. There is also lessened demand, as you can see from the graph, that the private consumption expenditure and government e consumption expenditure in that the dark blue one is private consumption expenditure that has steeply declined. That has steeply declined. And that is why, because there is decline in the demand, specifically when the Indian economy is going through a K-shaped recovery. K-shaped recovery means in some of the goods, consumer is demanding a lot. And for some of the goods, specifically the durable goods, consumer is losing the faith and not demanding that much. Therefore, the investments are also shooting down. 
so this k shaped recovery was seen in the terms of indian economy recovery after the covid so first is low private consumption no consumption no demand and hence less investment next is the altered historical consumption investment relationship please understand this previously what used to happen if something was not in demand then the companies or specifically the private companies try to get into that venture and created services so that it can assure the demand but now this has reversed even if they have seen that there there is falling demand they are also becoming lethargic and now not putting effort to boost up the investment in congruence with the demand that is being falling down so the alteration has also happened we have also certain structural problems and political uncertainty so there is russia ukraine war going on there is israel now iran has also came into the domain so a lot of world crisis is going on making the indian market also very very unpredictable then there are radical government policies like gst reforms uh, then they put up other reforms and other reforms like demonetization so that leads to policy uncertainty if i am not sure about the future how will i invest my money into it so political uncertainty is one of the reason then because government is trying to put in lot of investment into multiple sectors nowadays you have seen the pm gati shakti scheme etc it causes a crowding out effect because it lessens of the competition uh, for the private sector so they move out of the game so this is a crowding out which is done by excessive expenditure by the government or exp- excessive investment made by the government so these are some of the structural problems observed in economy then there are problems with reforms and with policy stability as well the kind of policy that we saw in 1991 it actually lasted for really long and that was a tectonic shift in policy it was very reformative but now since 2000 we are not seeing much of and very sustainable and long term going policies so therefore gst that was rolled out is still in lot of ruckus because of lot of confusions lot of detailing in it so as a result of this because of lack of reforming reform and political stability the private investors are not putting that much money into our cycles or into our sectors what are the implications if no investment then it will cause slower economic growth obviously there are certain views whether increased government investment will ever compensate the amount of loss that has incurred from private investment or not because then that in, during that time government will be cutting out from certain other sector let's say for from providing a certain social sector benefits certain schemes from ag- for agriculture for real estate etc so therefore the compensation would be a problem might also cause crowding out effect then there is efficiency concerns as well private sector is often seen more efficient as compared to government government so we know that government expenditure is going up it doesn't translate to that much profitability or efficiency because government working has got lot of loopholes as well which needs to be balanced so the best way forward would be to engage into public private partnership for enhancing the investments at the same time boosting the efficacy what can we do about it first of all bring a positive and conducive environment for the businesses to thrive in india this can be done with the help of enhancing our ease of doing business ease of doing business by relaxing the contractual norms some of the land reforms can be performed regulatory concerns can be slowed down so your ease of doing business can be leveraged by streamlining the entire registry process etc with the help of initiatives like digital india like enam like my gov portal and there are so many more then providing fiscal incentives and tax reforms the so government has already provided it in 2019 so the total corporate tax that the private sector has to give has been lessened to 22% for the already set up enterprises and up to 15% for the newly made newly ventured out enterprises so tax cut is also required for them because they are heavily burdened by the taxes next is the infrastructure development infrastructure development ke liye government has taken up pm gadhi shakti scheme building logistics national uh, pipeline project then we have got uh, financial sector reforms as well and we want them more but some of the financial sector reforms like doing away with the npa the non performing asset problem the bad the bad loan problem this is done with the help of insolvency and bankruptcy code of the government of india right we can also put up some land labor reforms do you know the example of andhra pradesh where they are calling for creating land banks or land pooling for cooperative farming and for also creating developmental projects in that pooled land and the revenue will be uh, duly shared across the stakeholders so that formula can also be used up second is 
we want political stability and predictability of the policy how can we ensure by including the stakeholders in the consultation process in the policy discussion phase this is taken up by niti ayog by the confederation of indian industries by fiki in many certain ways and this should be incorporated in a wider level for many other schemes as well this is how we'll be able to enhance our economic growth with the help of private investments now taking a very quick discussion on the topic of bhotshala kamal mola complex dispute so what is happening what is happening is that a 13th century complex that was developed by the parmar king mihir bhoj so he created it he created a complex there was a temple temple of goddess saraswati named as vag devi temple and then somewhere around 13th century it is alleged by the hindu front of justice which has filed this case in the high court of madhya pradesh that this this a particular mosque of 13th century was made in that place by demolishing the temple complex but the ruins still remain on the other hand the muslims are saying that there is no demolition in fact our sufi say in maula kamaluddin chishti upon whose name who lived there who lived in the dhar district for 40 years uh, on whose name this complex was created was there ever since uh, ever since the 13th century and there was nothing else before it and uh, where is this complex located it is located here in dhar this is the malwa region and this is dhar dhar was also the capital of parmar dynasty dhar and then the mandu mandu sher it is also located in dhar district only they both were the uh, capitals of they both mandu and dhar were the capitals of parmar dynasty now talking about raja bhoj which is important for prelims point of view so he is known as a philosopher king because he was a very brave king had a lot of military conquests and during his time the entire parmar dynasty saw zenith or the most glorious era ever in its dynastic event so what were the contributions of raja bhoj first of all expanded his his region to great extent specifically in the western sides of the india by doing mil multiple military conquest so he defeated the chalukyas of lata please remember what this lata lata is the region of gujarat so uh, he defeated chalukyas of lata shilaharas of konkan and chahamanas of shakambhari shakambhari or also known as sambar dynasty now this is the region not dynasty this is the region which is somewhere in the ajmer section somewhere near the ajmer or somewhere in the rajasthan so connecting rajasthan and up this is the shakambari region okay please remember and note down these regions because they can be asked in upsc then he also naturally assumed multiple titles one is the parmeshwara param bhattaraka he also gained the coveted a uh, title of kavi raj why because he used to write a lot as well he was very prominent literator of his time he wrote multiple literature for example saraswati kant bharana he also wrote bhuj bala bhim charu charya shringar prakashaka looking at it i am also able to recall another very important literature this is shringar shataka can you name which prominent literator of india has written shringar shatak okay so i'll be waiting for that in the comment section now going back to his literature he also had a court poet named dasabala dasabala wrote chintamani sarnika so kindly remember these two bolded texts and try to answer this one this is this is very important not only that the entire city of bhoj uh, of bhopal that you see today is named after raja bhoj only and uh, in fact he created this entire city of bhojpur which is now named as bhopal and bhojpur uh, was created in which uh, he also set up a bhojshala bhojshala was actually set up in dhar so this complex that we are talking about is bhojshala this is a temple con complex where also a lot of teachings used to happen so this was a center of education for sanskrit studies therefore he is a prominent educationist a philosopher king this was about this topic now let's look into the israel's defense system the context is that you know that iran made a lot of missile attack and 99% of it were deferred with the help of this very strong and robust defense system so what all missiles are included what all technologies are included might be asked in the examination so we'll be discussing so what happened that as israel attacked uh, uh, iran's embassy in damascus the capital of syria so iran retaliated by attacking lot of missiles and drones on it on 13th of april which were intercepted and 99% success was achieved because of this multi layered protection that 
Israel has against various air threat, be it as smallest drones or be it as fast as ballistic missiles or uh, as invisible as cruise missiles. So for all of them, they have got this multi-layered protection. So it's not just one missile, it's multiple layers. What are these? Let's understand before that. The beauty of these missiles is that they are able to intercept the attacked missile at multiple stages. What are the multiple stages of a missile? Once the missile is launched off, this is the boost stage, then it reaches the atmosphere where it becomes invisible for some time. This is mid course. And then when it reaches the ground before attacking the target, it is this, this declining trajectory is the terminal phase. It has got the capability of intercepting missiles at both terminal stage and boost stage. All right. So therefore, what are the components? We'll understand that first of all is the arrow system. Arrow system is a family of ballistic missiles which are shot in an array. Okay. So arrow two, the variant two intercepts ballistic missiles within the atmosphere, within the atmosphere, which means in the boost stage and in the terminal stage. But the arrow three has got more capacities. It can also attack something which is beyond the atmosphere, which means in the mid core stage as well. Look at the efficiency they have. Then we have got Iron Dome. Iron Dome is short range defense system intercepting somewhere about 100 to 200 kilometers. But we have got Stunner, lesser heard of because they are not using it. This is known as David's sling or stunner. This is medium range interceptor ballistic missiles having medium range of up to 300 kilometers. They have the capacity of not only intercepting the ballistic missiles. Ballistic missiles are somewhere something which is very, very easily uh, detectable because of the trajectory. It's, it has a predictable parabolic trajectory. But cruise missiles can be guided, can be hovered, very difficult to intercept, very difficult to understand where they're coming from, where they're going. It can intercept that as well. That is Stunner. Then they have Patriot Pac, Pac-3 and Pac-2. This were given to it by USA. They have got fighter jets and they have got Iron Beam. Now, Iron Beam is an advanced version of Iron Dome, which utilizes laser technology. It is still under development, but it will be having much more higher speed and accuracy and it will be able to penetrate through any object at all the three stages at one point in time. So this is the Iron Beam and this is the entire defense system created by Israel. Now, let's quickly move on to the prelim snippet. So first of all, we have got Hetty. So Hetty is a Caribbean island, which is a news because it's a civilian unrest. And it is uh, it is one Caribbean nation which has been under civil un unrest since, since many years, many decades, many, in fact, one century. So what is Hetty? Hetty is a Caribbean island, which is situated in this peninsula, or sorry, in this long island, which is known as the Hispaniola Island. As the name suggests, it must have been conquered or ruled by Spain for, for a bit of time. So yes, this entire island, including Haiti, was ruled by Spain for about two centuries. The western part, it was divided then before going away. The eastern part is the Dominion Republic and the western part is the Haiti Republic. Okay, Haiti is independent. In fact, it is world's first independent black-led republic, which got independence from two colonial rules. So it got ruled by Spain for two centuries and then it got ruled by France for one century, for about one century. And then they signed an agreement with the Hattian government. And then finally, they made it independent. In fact, this is the second independent nation or the nation on an island to get independence in the Western world. This first one being USA. So please remember first Caribbean island and second in the Western world to get the independent status. But ever since the independence, it has been in ruckus because of a agreement signed between the Haitian government and the uh, French government. So they signed an agreement in about 1924 and they said that uh, they have to give the Haitian government because we are leaving them, they have to give us a uh, certain indemnity and which is up to 30 billion dollars. It is valued up to 30 billion dollars today. So most of the external debt that uh, the Haiti is written off is actually because of this debt which is which it still is unable to pay. So they are asking for this compensation amount from the French government and that is causing and that is the news of the day. That is why we are re reading it. Of course the official languages would be Haiti and Creole and which is a form of Spanish language only and and the French language. The borders are very, very important. It is directly bordered by Dominion Republic, which is also a part of the Hispaniola Peninsula, uh, the Peninsula North Island. And it has got neighbors as Cuba, Cuba in the north, Jamaica in the west, and Puerto Rico in southeast. So these are the neighbors, and it has got only one 
neighbor which is touching its border or sharing its border the next one is paris pact for people and planet so it all started with the june declaration june declaration that happened in 2023 basically g20 summit was going on and then it was followed up by something which is known as nairobi declaration in kenya there also it was said that we have to take up we have to take up a thing called 4p 4p is the paris pact for people and planet and then in the new delhi declaration where the g20 summit was getting created or conducted so the new delhi declaration also called for the same thing so what is this paris pact which is being uh, time again iterated by multiple pacts and by multiple declaration so this is basically the most important thing that we need today it has got certain principles which says that no country should have to choose between fighting poverty and fighting to protect and preserve the planet so poverty planet and people should be taken care of together then it also gives a just energy transition principle and such partnerships it means that multiple countries be it the island nations be it the developed nations developing country uh, developing countries etc they have got different routes and mediums to perform transition not everything can be done alike appreciating that there should be certain partnerships created which are known as just energy transition partnership which is basically respecting the different route i'm taking towards achieving the same goal that is the paris climate goal of keeping the entire global temperature less than 1.5 degree centigrade okay it also helps other countries to get a certain amount of packages this is known as country packages for forest climate and nature it also tries to include private capital flow so it also enables scaling up of private capital flows and this is the pact which is running errands now the next one is a very important scheme coming from ministry of heavy industries this is the fame scheme stands for faster adoption of and manufacturing of electric and hybrid vehicles in india so as we know that the entire world is moving towards transition transitioning towards low carbon or low emission mobility or green mobility for that you have to make a lot of evs but evs come with a lot of challenges we do not have infrastructure like charging stations for electric vehicles we don't have enough consumer confidence uh, of course they are very very expensive as compared to the conventional vehicles to do away with all of this the government of india has put up the scheme under the second phase which commenced from 2019 will be lasting for up to 5 years and this scheme has got certain targets in which government will be providing subsidy for adaptation of two wheelers three wheelers four wheelers in fact buses public transports so it is calling for electric electrification of public transports and the other vehicles that are used so government is trying to incentivize via the scheme so fame scheme is specifically in use because elon musk is coming in the tesla motors probably will be setting up some investments so in order to make the environment more conducive for him this is a talk about the fame scheme and how we can enhance our uh, uh, fdis or we can liberalize our fdis and uh, our investments attractiveness in four specifically in four wheelers electric vehicles so this was a news and we have also read about the fame scheme please remember this is not by ministry of electronics this is by ministry of heavy industries and now guys the last news of the day talking about india's outward fdi performance so fdi is a foreign direct investment which is coming either to the india or going from the india so it's coming a lot towards the india but what about investment that has to move out of india so according to the trend and stats this outward flowing fdi is declining it has declined up to 39% So in 2023 the outward investment was somewhere about 46 billion dollars from India towards other countries and now it has declined up to 40% to 28.64 billion so i hope you've understood what is outward fdi so obviously if i am not investing or if i am not making a capital investment in terms of fdi then in the longer run i will be having a net balance of payment in this regard so that is that is a crisis which can happen because the countries who are investing in my country in the longer run in the shorter run i am having the profit but in the longer run they will be taking up their shares and profits and dividends they'll be uh, they'll be getting the profits but india will be somewhere 
capital deficit in that regard so that is a concern what are the reasons reasons highlighted are uncertain global economic conditions india and the private investors are not very sure whether they should be uh, investing into countries which are already rushing through inflations and high spike in oil prices and the other import goods etc there are also certain regulatory and policy environment which is not very conducive for the indian market you also know already know about the usa and uh, some of the regulations that are made by canada and by france and germany etc so these are the reasons then domestic investment focuses more because the government is trying to leverage the investment in the previous article we have seen that even in the domestic front private investment is low but it's not as low as compared to the outward fdi outward fdi is pretty low we are not investing outward which is also needed to understand about this we have to understand and look into the chapter of balance of payment so this is a homework for you to read the entire basics of balance of payment how many accounts do we have the current account the capital account outward fdi forms a part of which account this is a homework for you so please ensure that you do it for better conceptual clarity so this is all about today's session i hope you've understood it well and to check that can i ask a question to you which is the only active volcano in india can you name that on that note i'll end up the session thank you so much and all the very best